Well, first of all, Wopita, Chachi, I'll be in my language. I feel washed in, I feel cheese up. Shake your hands and the best feelings. And um, I'm really thankful for you wanting to be back. Back in the day when I had red rage. And you really wanted to be out of town by sunset. So <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> things have definitely changed in my growth. Um, I was going to tell you a little story years ago when we went to Rapid City. And they asked me to talk at this treatment program. We were talking about peacemaking, and you know how it is with um, our people. We always start on the Indian time, right? And but this morning we started on time. But uh, so I was sitting there and waiting for the workshop to begin, and it was maybe half hour into the time. And I thought, well, I'm going to the bathroom the last time. So I have this dress on, and I go to the bathroom. And the reason I'm telling the story when I went into your bathroom, it reminded me of that type of bathroom. I shut that door, and I thought, oh, I couldn't get out. <laughs> <laughs> and so it did happen to me in Rapid City. At the so I go in and I go to the bathroom and I was going like this and I couldn't open the door. And I thought, well, surely if I stand there for a while, somebody will come in. So I waited and I waited and sat down again. <laughs> <laughs> Stood up, nobody came. And then I thought, oh, you're ready to start probably. This took about 10 minutes, so I was still in that stall. And I looked down and it had that partition like here and I thought, I'll crawl under. <laughs> that was about 75 pounds of those. So, <laughs> so I knelt down and then I got on my back and I was scooching out and here the coordinator, the person who introduced me. <laughs> oh, and did this morning like Mary did. She walks in and she goes, hey, and she's looking up and then she kind of goes like that. She sees me laying down. And <laughs> And the story, I think, is adaptability. We handle whatever we have to do. She looks down at me and she says, um, we're ready to start. <laughs> like I'm laying down there every day. <laughs> so I crawled out of there. But my dress, the other thing is my dress was caught on the door. So I had a PTSD moment with the bathroom. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. Okay. So I have, I'm going to try to squeeze in a lot of what I want to share with you this morning and then we can fit other pieces to the <coughs> But I want to start from a place of realizing what has happened to us. And that way you can, as we go through this minefield of what has happened with us with trauma, and, and all of us are in recovery. And that recovery process will be lifelong. When we get to that point, if we haven't done recovery work by the time we're 90, we need to do it in our last, our next lifetime. But really, I'm 64, and it's going to be the rest of my life. I will have to always renegotiate learnings for my children. They're my teachers. So it's a lifelong process, and it doesn't have to be laborious. You can take breaks from it. <clears throat> and uh, there's so much in life that we begin to fear when we're not in recovery. And that's one of the characteristics that I want to talk about today is fear of the ordinary. One of the biggest things of post-traumatic stress disorder is fear of ordinary things, even being in a room with people. So I'll talk about that, but before I begin, I want you to think about something um, in our room. <clears throat> There's two cups um, to think about when we see the world, and one, of course, is that native cup. The other one is the western cup where we've received a lot of injury. There's that cup over there. So what I encourage you to do, as much as possible, to recover your path from this cup here. Because we know all about this, right? We live in urban areas. We live in reservation areas. We went to public school systems. Some of us went to boarding school. But even when we went to boarding school, we had to learn this. So we know this. we're pretty competent in this world. But we're not so competent in this all the time. So part of the relearning is to figure out when somebody tells me something or I'm required to do something, I need to go back to this cup. Because if I don't, that's that whole thing about decolonization that we're talking about. Automatically, my mind is going to flip into how they told me to do it. An example would be if I develop a JDC center on the reservation, instead of developing it from this cup, I go to some city or place and look at a JVC center and say, oh, it's got to be this way. And then when people try to bring it through here, which is who we are, and we have this in our blood and genetically, it's with us. All we have to do is revive it. 
So that's the framework I want to start with. And so I'm going to start over here. And this that I'm going to talk about comes from here, the Western Cup. So in my work, when I talk about trauma, one of the things that I realized was that some of our women grew up to be mean girls. And you know what happens with mean girls? They grew up to be mean women, right? Real tough girls. And so all of us have been like that at some point. We can't deny that. Some a little bit tougher than others. Some have a lot of friends, but real, real tough. And you know how it is when we try to do something. In the world of oppression, um, it's hard anyway in the Western Cup. In the world of internalized oppression, which is the cultural cup, it's even harder because every time you try to do something good, somebody's going to try to take you out, right, from your own people. So that's a given. We have to accept that. They are going to do that, but now I have to think, okay, it doesn't mean that I have to slay them or do whatever. I just have to know it's coming. And I, when I understand it, it doesn't have as much power. And I heard John Trudell say something one time, and it really stuck with me. He said, when people give you trouble, don't become the trouble. When people give you trouble, don't become the trouble. Because sometimes we get more out of control than they did, right? And it's like, whoa, who's the, who's the one that's initiating this right now? So having said that, one from the, we're going to look at how this Western cup over here has warped our way of seeing things. Okay, Native females. Okay, it means to make sexual and character or quality. So a lot of us, in the beginning of our traumatized lives, are probably male and women. It means that um, we felt like we couldn't live without men, right? No matter how mean or hard the setting was. So having said that, the second characteristic that I'll talk about this afternoon and try to tuck this away, because of our trauma, we're attached to pain. That attachment that happens in our spirit is I'm attached to being, um, have someone being mean to me. So I accept that as normal. That's very, very important because when you're two years old and you see somebody being hit, the attachment process begins. And so it goes way, way back. And so when we look at this Western concept of being sexual in character, it's like, wow, you know, even if this person is mean to me, I can't live without them. And then once that one leaves, I look for a new candidate that is just like that one, right? I start doing interviews, and I think, oh yeah, this one fits the bill. And then I stay. <laughs> it's real crazy how we keep um, doing the same thing over and over again. So the message out of that is, marry some, before you marry someone else, marry yourself. You have to learn how it is to be alone. Because loneliness is scary if we don't know how to make relationships with ourselves. And part of that is fear of the ordinary. And I'll give you an example of even little tiny things. I remember I was traveling somewhere and I wanted to see this movie, so I was going to leave the motel and some of the participants were coming in and they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the movie. And somebody said, by yourself? <laughs> I said, yeah. Do I need to gather people up to go with me? But that's an example. Oh, I'd be embarrassed to see by myself. I don't even know these people, so why would I be embarrassed? But that's the framework that we have. Is like, for me, I have to sit by myself. And it goes back to the school when I sat in the lunchroom by myself or somebody was hating on me. So those are things that we have to examine because otherwise we buy into the concept that we have to be male dependent. Now remember that, male dependent. <coughs> on the other side of the coin, with um, our men in our society, they also are female dependent because they've been raised, so there's a miscue going on in relationships. We've been taught, so we've been taught certain things and it's not meeting each other. It's miscuing. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, what is beauty? Again, um, this is the Western Cup. For some reason, we've been sexualized to think that we have to look like this to be attractive. And so we start doing that with our four-year-olds, right? We have little tiny girls that are dressed like that. And the thing to remember is in the communities, wherever you go, native or non-native, and this isn't about being old-fashioned, just be about being honoring yourself and being protective. If you dress a little girl that, that sexual in character, there are perpetrators out there. So you're making that little girl more subject to perpetration because she looks like a little woman. And there are no little four-year-old women. You know, they're four-year-old beautiful spirits. So over here, this is, look at how beautiful they are. 
These are some of our Ishnati girls in our coming of age ceremony at home. We have 101 of them that have gone through the ceremony in my home. We revived it, and of course there was a lot of hating when we uh, revived it, because everybody said, who do you think you are starting this? Who appointed you to be spiritual? And it's, it's about um, being human beings. So this is an example of, and I really love to go through this with young girls, because nobody ever talks to them, and that's what we have here today as a sisterhood. We're having the sisterhood conversation that if you do not talk about this, it's the culture of silence. Nobody ever said that. And all they see is the TV, the videos, YouTube, whatever else. And that's the message that is given for, for the little people. So being aware of that and what our role is in teaching and combating that. Um, the, the problems that Native women face are compared to society on a whole. So we tell a story that relates to that. One. So when the colonists first came, they came to the eastern shores and they met the Iroquois and other tribes. And they said, uh, we want to make a treaty with you. And of course, they were scheming on our land at the time. They got off the boat. And so uh, here's what the Iroquois men said, which is really grand. They said, wait. We can't sign any kind of treaty or anything without our clan mothers and our grandmothers. And here's what the men said, and just think of this echo in our communities now. The colonial men said, what? You need your women? Do you hear that now? Our men saying that? What? You need a woman? And the, the men said, yes, we need our clan mothers and our grandmothers to be here. So they went and got them, and they were part of the treaty process. So every single act began to erode at that cultural cup. And so pretty soon, in the colonial world, they said that you could, of course, strike your woman as long as the stick was no longer, no bigger than your thumb. So the word, the meaning, rule of thumb, means that yes, it was all right to beat your woman as long as it wasn't a big stick. And just think, that, that would hurt, that big. And so we begin to see that, and things begin to change in our native society. We begin to compete. Now, when people talk about matriarchs and patriarchs, the only kind of matriarch that would exist is if there were Amazon women who did everything. But they need men to produce too, right? So they can't. There's no such thing as a as a, <coughs> a pure matriarchy. What we had was an egalitarian society. It was based on labor. It was based on role, and it was based on the need of the people. So it wasn't like, oh, this is a man thing, this is a woman thing. It was like, it's what the camp needed to survive. So remember that word, egalitarian. When they say, oh, we're matriarch or we're patriarch, that's a Western concept. Egalitarian is that we were a gender-based equal society. So now we have to reach that um, to not only our daughters, but our sons. And if we have sons and we don't have a father figure there, we've got to find one because there are some things that, that moms can't teach. But we, that's the challenge is to find healthy males to be able to teach them. Because there are absolutely some things that I can't teach my sons, that I haven't been able to, that I have to reach out and find men to teach them. So that's that. So I want to lay that out and say, OK, we're redefining our whole world. And, how, and if we didn't do it in our lifetime, in our daughter's lifetime, we absolutely have to do this for the grandchildren little grand girls that are coming up. I like that, grand girls. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, the traditional upbringing, the strong female influence and the teachings, teachings given to young women, that's happening here in this room today. This is a sisterhood where we're going to talk, we're going to have a discussion about how we are when we go into the future and, if, and how we have to make a commitment. In my language, Wolchenzek means to make a commitment. That for me, as a 64-year-old woman, for the past 15 years or so, I've been re renegotiating my relationship with my children, particularly my daughter, because I had some red rage early on in our relationship, and so she's a tough one, because she's just like mom. She's like enough. So now we have to make peace, and we have to renegotiate that relationship. And it, it's a, an exciting journey, but there all, it takes humility because we have to acknowledge that you made mistakes, and you have to ask for forgiveness on both sides. And so that's part of that. Sisterhood, we can, it's easier to do it together. When you're in a circle like this to say, yeah, I did that to my daughter. And somehow we have to make 
peace and, and prayer is probably the, the place to start. Um, and I'll talk about that too. Those sisterhood connections, these are the moms and the grandmas at the Ishnanti right before the marriage <coughs> ceremony, right before the girls come out of the teepee and they are indeed becoming women. Right before they come out and then the forehead is painted red. But you can see the support there, the anticipation, the strength, and when we have this ceremony, these women grieve because they, some of them never had the ceremony. And so it's a sad time for them, but they also know that their children get to, their daughters get to carry this on. So it's grieving, and some of them have said, could we have a Ishna tea for me even though I'm 60? And I said, well, maybe next time around. <laughs> but that's part of the grieving process. Okay. Beauty is taught to be more than physical. Other factors, obviously, the humility, the caring, the respect, kindness, all of that. This is, um, in my family, the matriarch or the woman who has a lot of direction in my family. This is my older sister. This is one of my younger sisters. But when decisions are made that are huge, obviously, like you, you take it back to the family and say, um, sisters, what are we going to do for dealing with this? And what do we need to do? But we also need to do that on a larger community level to reteach this among the young people because that sisterhood is really powerful. And we've been colonized to think that, oh, that one, you know, she's, did you ever see the way she looks at people and, you know, her butt's too big and whatever kind of, so young girls say that all the time. They make fun of each other's bodies. And so that's program behavior and we have to be able to challenge it in a good way. Uh, with these morals and values put into our young minds, there's a possibility that we'll stay connected. This is my auntie, my uh, mother auntie in the middle. Her name is Mary Louise Defender, and she's 84 years old. She lives at Standing Rock right now, but she's the one who continually says that. And she uh, comes and does our ceremony with our Ishnati, and she keeps saying that you've got to reteach these young girls. You have to reteach them because there's destruction has occurred. Look at this societal upbringing. From early on, girls are taught to be a certain way. Um, the princess syndrome down here. There's <laughs> so we wait for that perfect male to come along and rescue us. There's no such thing. There's no perfection. Over here, the girls, in a sense, in the TV was that way, but there's a certain male dependency that comes into to play. And again, we do not talk about this with our, our girls. They see it on the internet, and they just assume that they have to be sexual in character for boys to like them. And we have to, and we don't have to chew them out. We just say we have those conversations, and we can talk about them and get to questions. Okay, lookism. Look at this over here that promotes dependency. Twenty-one sneaky tricks to get guys to do what you want. <laughs> My son said that. They said, why don't they just ask us? <laughs> why don't they just ask? If they, they don't have to be sneaky. But what is this promoting? It's promoting dishonesty and sexuality. And this is what our girls read. And so, again, it's not to condemn them, but it's to teach the other side. Because all of the information is coming out over here. So we have to recreate gatherings where we don't make fun of them, we don't shame them, we don't blame them. We just say, this is how it is. And then we laugh and we have a good time. I remember one of the little Braveheart girls came into the kitchen one time at my house and there was a bunch of the Braveheart grandmas. There were about 10 of them and we were just being silly and laughing and she came in and she was about 14. And here's the statement of affirmation. She goes, oh, I can't wait to be a grandma. <laughs> Can you imagine? That has nothing to do with this. It's like, oh, I can't wait to be a grandma. So that's an ultimate compliment on that. And the distorted self-image, that fear of not fitting in, again, that's all I, our, our girls see. Look at the way those little girls are dressed. This one looks like a, a big woman, right? She's just a little baby girl. Five-year-old old girls think they need a boyfriend. Um, the older person with clothing, we need to allow our children to be children. That's a good place to start is to to let your children be little little children and not push them into that. Um, during these, this is a dangerous time between and teen uh, middle school and high school. They're trained to sexualize themselves to catch the attention of the opposite sex. I went into a school not long ago. Um, I think it was last spring, and this little girl 
asked me afterwards to talk to you. And this is really, it's really a sad story, but it's the example of the culture of silence that nobody has ever talked to her about this. So I'm going through the girls' <coughs> silent culture and I'm talking about how girls need to honor themselves. And then she says, hey, can I talk to you afterwards? And I said, sure. <coughs> so I'm always, that always happens. So I'm sitting with her in the classroom and she comes up and she says, um, I just want to talk to you about my boyfriend. And I said, okay, and she's about 12 or 13. And I said, your boyfriend, huh? And I said, how old is he? She said, he's same age as me. And I said, oh, so what's going on? And I didn't like judge her about having a boyfriend because she already had him. And so I said, what's going on? And she said, well, they're saying that he broke up with me. And I said, oh, so how do you know that? She said, I got texts from other girls telling me that he doesn't like me anymore. And I said, did he tell you? And she said, no, but they're all telling me that's what he's going to do. And so, um, but it's OK. And I said, oh, so you were, it's, it's OK. And she said, yeah, because he bites me. And I said, what? Yeah, he bites me. And I said, like, biting you? And she said, yeah, but I know he does that because he loves me. And she showed me, she pulled up her arm, and then she had a bruise right here that looked like a bite mark. And I thought, oh, this little baby girl. And imagine a 12 or 15 year old. And to her, that was like normal. And so I said that he has no right to do that. You know that. There's, you're just too precious. And of course, when I looked at the little boy, he's just a little tiny boy. I thought, oh my gosh, let me get hold of that little boy. <laughs> he was just little. I mean, he was like not as mature as her, but I, that's where the intervention needs to occur. And so I talked to the counselor and I said, we need to work with these two little ones. But it's this whole thing here that the other girls were saying that she wasn't good enough and he was going to go find another girl. She's only 12 or 15 years of age. So this is now. That is their social currency. You have to realize, you know how if you lose a job or you you have a divorce, that's really devastating for you? At that same level, when the girls are talking about each other, that is as important to them as it is your divorce or whatever else is going on. That's the social currency that is happening to them at that point. So these conversations are really crucial. And the majority of the time, nobody ever talks to them, right? They're negotiating this all by themselves, and sometimes they're not. I'm dealing with the community in South Dakota where a little girl hung herself because of what was happening to some girls. So it's come to our communities now. And that's why it's really important um, for not to be mean women. But in order to not be mean women, we need to do some healing work, and that's where I'm going to get into the red rage and the trauma. Um, but when we challenge this, if we ask the girls to challenge this, the other girls are going to turn on them, so they need support, just like we need support. Because women are really good at gossiping about each other, right? That's the big thing that we do. And so if we can turn it to good gossip, like an example, when you leave the circle, bad gossip will be say, uh, went to that workshop, same old, same old, heard the same old thing, didn't make any difference. Good gossip is saying, we had a chance to talk about being a woman, which is about not being being women. That's good gossip. So the, the intent of it comes into play. So just think about this uh, Western Cup. Thanks, I you read my mind. I need to share that. Um, uh, but what to wear, what to say, how to act, who to hang out with. And these are really, really crucial decisions that are made by middle school. I work with middle school. I teach the language with my son. And these little girls are confronting us every single day. And then you younger girls, you, if you remember probably very recently, there's some mean things that have occurred, right? Mm -hmm. And the last thing in the world that we need to do is to be fighting over men or boys. I do men's circles and boys' circles, and you know what the boys say? When I get to school or early high school boys together, and girls are fighting over them, you know what they say? Jesus. <laughs> And when the girls hear that, they say, whatever. I say, well, that's what the boys say. The girls are stupid. But they like it at the same time. Because it enhances their self-esteem. So again, conversations that we have to have. These are ordinary. And sometimes daughters won't ask. 
their moms, maybe they'll go to their grandma, or maybe they'll go to a Muka relative, but maybe in a circle, just hearing this, it'll enter their consciousness because it might be too embarrassing. Okay, that next one. Image distortion. Whenever I show this one, somebody always says, give her some fry bread. <laughs> feels like she's never been good enough. And so there's that thought that somebody's making judgments about how I look. And one good thing I have to say about the Indian world, I had an awesome opportunity to be a judge at the Indian pageant up at United Tribes this past September. It doesn't really matter what size you are. It matters if you know your culture, your language, how you are to the elders, and how you behave. I was a judge for four days. I have never worked so hard. I always had this stereotype image of being a pageant for a beauty or a judge for a pageant. Oh my gosh, those girls were amazing. There were two girls that were engineers. They had graduate degrees. And these girls were really something. So I'm happy to report that we still have those standards that are based on what is inside of us. But we have to maintain that, otherwise we exist. There's other characteristics that female are to uphold as they become women. Here's what I tell the young people in the community when I talk to the men, young men and boys or girls in the schools. So when your brother or your male relative comes to the house, and maybe they don't have a place to stay because we always take care of our relatives, right? So they come and they don't have a place to stay. The first signal is when that boy maybe is sleeping on the couch and somebody comes in and says, could you help? Could you take out the trash? And then they have an attitude. Not even their house to have an attitude. But there is a flag to say, okay, this needs to be addressed as a grandmother. So I do that at my house and at the Great Park Lodge. I watch for that because it's a teachable moment where I can sit that young man down and say, you know what? You have to take care of us. This is how you do this. This is how you help. It's not free. You can't stay here and expect somebody to feed you and take care of you. Because a lot of them are raised that way. And you know, when we have this conversation, you all of you know this. So it's like, why is she talking about that? But these younger ones do not, because I went into a school, I same old thing. One of the little girls, she said, you know what? Faith, when you said that, that reminded me of my sister. And I said, what do you mean? She's got a boyfriend and he plays video games all night. He sleeps all day. And I said, and she works? She said, yeah. So these are our values of poverty and distortion that have come about. So we have to reteach. We have to remold a lot of the young people. And so it's it's not labor, it's just setting, setting the rules. And so a lot of our kids are, are dealing with those things. Okay, thanks. Um, already talked about that one. Oh, what about the term white beater? Right? Those t-shirts. So shirts? Yeah. I know that the, the kids at home, they sure don't want to wear those around me. I remember we had a gathering one time with one little kid, and she had that on. She went, Okay, uh, examples for young girls, the role models, those are the Bratz dolls. I never saw any dolls shaped like that at that little tiny age. So that, again, it's implanting it in their minds of how it needs to be. And of course, Hannah Montana, she's grown up now, but that was one of the ones that a lot of the girls looked up to, the sexual image. Dakota Daddy. That's <laughs> <laughs> it, huh? We found this on the internet. Actually, my granddaughter found this on the internet. But a man is the one who raises a child. His role does not end at conception. So we have to have these conversations with the young men particularly, because I think our girls are strong because they see that mothers are strong. But because we don't have the strong male role, male role models, they look for women who will probably take care of them because of their conflicts with their own mothers. And so like this little boy here, he's going to need some male teachers along his way if he doesn't, if, you know, and hopefully the father will be there. But because otherwise, um, women become dependent on males making decisions for them, including getting pregnant and the males choosing, and then he leaves. I remember I told the little Braveheart girls at our camp, I said, I don't want you to ever hear this, and I did hear it. 
that somebody comes up and says, um, well, he's the one that wanted me to have his baby. Oh. You have a part to play in that. You are a co-creator. You decide when that child is going to come. It's not because he wanted it. It's good that he wants it, but it's, it's a, a decision that you make for that child. Okay, next one. Um, healthy role models. Go ahead to the next one. Okay. Loss of cultural respect for women and girls by ourselves and by males, and the unawareness of teachings of the origin stories with ours, our teachings were brought by women. And I know it's different from tribal cultures, but a lot of times it was the, the women who brought the teachings. And it's not that they're better, it's just that egalitarian society. It creates male dependent females, and they're not, they're not whole if you don't have a man. The society has taught us that. Even if we have to take care of them, even if they don't have jobs, and it's, it's, not, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And, and if you search in your tribal languages, there's a word for it. In my language, Indihecha means to be competent. The greatest attribute that you could have in somebody coming to your house right away to get up and say, they start sweeping, they start taking out the trash or start washing the dishes, and then one of the grandmas would say, oh, the Gihecha, they know how to help. What a wonderful feeling. But they're getting up, they're holding the blankets. If the boys get up and throw the blankets and leave, that's that's light, right? Get back in there, pull that blanket, because it's a it's an act of masculinity. Okay, so we have to discover our own gifts. Uh, marry yourself before you marry anyone else. Cradle our wounded places, and that's what we're going to talk about today, because we become dependent when we have to take care of ourselves, and we'll talk about that. Um, remember, the most common way people give up their power is thinking that we don't have any. So that takes us into the trauma work. Any thoughts on this? Is this how it is? And remember I talked about the culture of silence where we don't talk? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a couple of comments. Did you have them? Yeah, I've been okay. They're coming up with new ways to treat trauma. And you know, people are, they're unexplainable, but they Yes, you'll have to talk about it. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, my daughter, uh, my name's Tony, I'm from the county up there, Pomo and Winnebago. Uh, my daughter was taught my way, uh, really, like you brought up, being tough and mean. And uh, that was her nature, was just to be that way. And I didn't nurture her that way at all. I, I mean, I didn't nurture her like I should have, with affection and all that. She doesn't like to be touched today. Um, but I, I like how you said that we teach them the wrong way because we're the cups, the two native cups was a very good example. Yeah. And we are shamed and shut out when we try to go back and teach that way. And, and, and now I'm hearing it's okay to do that. And, yeah. Yeah. And the two important things to remember is that you did the best that you could. Because that's what you were you were teaching for self-preservation. So now the the growing work can be done to say, let's look at that. We did it a different way, now let's try it for your daughter. So like my daughter says, I have a PhD in mom. <laughs> she even knows when my eyebrow goes up a certain way and I think, oh, I gotta work at this, I gotta work, it takes work. I yes. was gonna finish off by um, then I have two grandgirls, and she had, um, I taught the little one, the first one, this is Ho Chunk Boy, he's an out of state, fancy dancer, but we're homo, California. Yeah. She does that on her, her mom taught her that, she said that dancer for homo. But I don't do homo. And then my little one I want to teach out of state, but the dad doesn't want it, so I'm like, I am the native woman here, and I am going to teach her. I don't yeah. care what he says. But I like how you said you have to teach men also. Yes, I believe in that. Yes, and we don't have to do it the shaming way. We have to do it in a way that realizing we set our boundaries. Yes. This is not okay. And early in the relationship, you can see that. I remember my daughter telling me, she said, I know you told me over and over and over again to watch for the flags for abusive relationships, but she said I had to flirt with it. And she was up at the Rapid City Mall, and she said she went in and got a CD. She came out, it was her car, her money, her shopping, feeding him, here she was flirting with this, because she thought this guy was really cool, and he was a cool guy, he was really a handsome guy. And so she gets a CD and she goes out to the car, they get in and she puts it in, and then all of a sudden he, he 
pushes it and it pops up. And then she looked at him and she thought, did he just do that? And so she pushed it again and again. And he did it again. And then he, she did it again and then he pulled it out. And then she said she, he looked at her in a way that was so, she said it put up the hairs on the back of her neck. Oh my gosh, I saw it. And it was like, oh, there it is. You can just feel that, right? And she said, I listened. There it was. That was a, a flag. And so it was a matter of control. So those are the kind of flags that we have to pay attention to. And it did play itself out. She walked away from that one, luckily. And a couple more comments before we go on. Um, Bonnie, can you bring up my uh, trauma one? Or no, the red rage one. A couple other comments. Yes. Yeah, what's wrong with you? You're by yourself. No one wants you, and that's not even the point. Maybe I, I choose to be that way. Yes. Um, for me, it's like I, I, I have that feeling of being a little bit of 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 a That's a classic example of what happens when you've been injured. We internalize the oppression, and that's what happens with mean girls. Somebody was mean to me, so I know all about this. You know, I really know how to be mean. So unless we make a conscious effort to heal from the original trauma, the original trauma goes back to whatever happened to you in the beginning when all of this started to stack up. That's where you need to go, and I'll do an exercise here in a little bit that will allow you to do that, because one of the things that I've been, um, seen in domestic violence programs, some of the women in there are really mean because they haven't had the chance to heal. And it's like, whoa, this is scary. Because they, if that isn't made aware, they're going to be just as forceful. And they're like replicating the males. So that's a Western model again. But that's really classic that happens over and over again. Because I've been hurt and nobody's ever going to hurt me again. <laughs> so everybody's better get out of my way. <laughs> that's the red rage. Yes? Well, for many years, you know, growing up and uh, being raised and everything came out of the. I was quite that But you know, the other. Yeah, culture, the Western one. The Western culture. Part of that in my raising was to please other people. Yes. Regardless of what you, you sacrifice for your husband, your children. And that's been, even at my age, it's been very hard the last, I'll say, 15 years to get rid of. Right. I know I deserve, I deserve the attention I can give myself, the attention that other people give me. But something still, it's very hard to let go of that I don't deserve that. Yep. And yet I know I do. I've worked hard my whole life, you know, my whole working life. And I embrace my native culture but there's still that part, and that's from the Western culture, yeah. that I can't let go of, and it's and it because I see it's all my grandmother, sacrificing for my grandpa, my mother, sacrificing for her children, never remarrying, yeah. or, or always saying, I'll never remarry, because yeah. of children, the yeah. ones that, you know, my brother would be so. That another man could not care for us, it's like the natural father. Yeah. And so my that was processed in my mind as I sacrifice my happiness for you children. Yep. And so that it's very deep. It yep. is, it's very deep. And I have to remind myself daily, why do you work, you know, do this for yourself because it makes you feel good, because it makes you you think better of yourself rather than this would make him happy. Yep. I mean that's I think what you're talking about, and it's important for us to realize that, is you're talking about maybe your spirit behind it. So you know how sometimes you feel like your spirit's not here, and you get lonesome so for it? Mm -hmm. That is actually losing your spirit, because in my tribal culture, growing up with my grandmother, who was a healer, 
where they put in our language and we call it healer, we called it ma'apio, man, woman who would take care of things. There would be times when she would work with people and call their spirits back because if you suffered a lot of trauma, you're not standing in full spirits. And so you feel really lonely and you think, ah, you know, everything's happy right now. You know, all the kids are here, but what, I just feel like I'm by myself. And so I'll talk about that and calling back the spirit when we get into this. Yes? I just wanted to kind of comment on the fact that she was I've always been the abuser, you know, I'm trying to learn. I've always been the abuser, you know, and I'm trying to learn how to not be that way, you know, because I'm really working on myself right now. It's hard. Like you said, that comment, you know, um, you've been, I've been hurt before, and I don't want to get hurt. So. Right. I never heard of anybody again, you know, and it's just, I'm really abusive, I was like, I get really mean, you know, yeah. I just need to learn how I'm not to be that way. Yeah. I'm so angry, I don't even know what I'm angry about. Yeah. And, you, and that's important that you're acknowledging it, because in the sisterhood, that's going to help you heal, and you need the support to be able to, to say, yes, I have this rage. I have this rage because somebody injured me, and that's your trauma. But, so you're going to need to identify your original trauma where it all began. Okay? And then it'll become apparent as we go on this morning. Yes? I know a lot of us have like racial, you know, racial trauma, racial, uh, we become racist and not mean, we're not taught that way. But, you know, when I, when my grandmother would say something to me that was derogatory, like she didn't like me dressing a certain way or wearing my makeup too strong, uh, I could always understand it because she explained it to me. And, you know, I got over it because she explained it to me. Yeah. But she made me miserable for a short time. And when, you know, you go out to the community and there's white people, sorry, but when there's like Anglo Saxons or there's, you know, sometimes for me now, currently it's not just white people, but it's people who are well off or who have things. And um, there's no explanation for it because there's corruption and there's all these other things that are involved that there is no. Uh, if there's no, um, you know, right explanation for it. Yeah. 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 That's important to acknowledge that the trauma didn't yeah. stop. And I think that, um, I know I'm yeah. going up over here, but let me explain something. We live in what is called um, a post-conflict society. So that means that, you know how Obama said that we have no troops now in Iran? The war didn't end. For the United States, they're saying, oh, the war has ended. I think not. The war is going to continue for generations. Because they've changed everything by going there, like, just like they changed it for us. They, they, they negated the role of women. They um, killed the role of, of males. And so in this post-conflict society, we're still absolutely in a war. And that's what you're talking about. This trauma is continuing to happen a downstream effect and so when we're not aware of that we take it out on each other like you're talking about you really piss me off don't look at me like that because I got all this other whatever to deal with and then we, it just becomes in our neurons it comes in our spirit and then you become scary people and we've all been there. yes we've seen other people model that behavior for a long time so we think that's the way we should do it um, something I run um, Facebook yesterday too, it was um, somebody posted by Jada Pinkett, and it um, kind of ran along the same lines as um, the colonizer men created the woman to be sexual, and the woman not being able to be in touch with their spirit or may have lost her spirit, um, therefore the man is dealing with only half a woman nowadays, and uh, same thing in return, the man is only half a man today. And that's the Western concept in our cultural concept in the spirit not fully present. So we would say that, they would say half a man, half a woman over here, we'd say your spirit was injured and it went away. Those of you that are sexual abuse survivors, I'm a sexual abuse survivor, when something hard is happening, that spirit goes out and just goes, like I can't see this, I can't experience it, I'm not here. And then so one of the characteristics of individuals who've been molested or violated when they're young, they have large periods of blankness there where they don't remember the event because why would I remember that? And even at maybe family gatherings, people will say, do you remember when we did this? And they won't remember because they were too busy seeing if they were safe. They, they missed the event. 
It's like, is the perpetrator here? Is he here? Or is she here? And it's not even paying attention to what's going on. So it doesn't get instilled in the memory. So um, having looked at that, let's look at what you identified, the rage that you have. And there's outward rage, there's also silent rage. Silent rage is really scary. Because when you get peeled, you probably see it, right? But the silent rage, and that's what we see when people explode. It's like, oh my God, where did that come from? Is that you? <laughs> She's going, bing, bing, bing. <laughs> so that's the scary one, because you never know when that one's going to go. And usually, a lot of times, people will get really quiet right before the, the blow comes. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> So you all recognize those behaviors, and let me do something here. 